before I even talk to you about how to do effective animal rights outreach on the streets, I need to talk to you about what it is that we mean when we talk about veganism. What does veganism actually mean? If you ask a group of people what it means to be vegan, you will most likely get multiple versions of what they believe it to be. This can be frustrating. I, I know that a lot of you um, probably have the same idea of veganism that we do, which is that it is purely about the animals and it's an ethical stance against animal abuse. Um, but as you know, even within the animal rights movement, within veganism, within the vegan movement, uh, you have so many people that view it to be something else. And um, I wanna clarify that this is very important because where you are coming from when you speak about veganism uh, will shape much of your outreach when you're speaking about this to other people. So in our view, Veganism has nothing to do with human health and it has nothing to do with the environment as much as the environment does impact the animals. It has nothing to do with human rights and it also, and this needs to be clarified as well, it also has nothing to do with affection towards animals. Um, there is a lot of language that gets tossed around in this movement um, pertaining to loving animals and you know you can't love animals and eat them for example is is a common phrase that i hear um but whether you love or absolutely despise animals has no bearing over the moral issue of what humans are doing to animals when they choose to not be vegan you can despise animals you can hate them absolutely hate them if if that's how you feel I think that there's nothing wrong with that, actually. As long as you keep that to yourself and your views don't then carry over into violence and carry over into acts of oppression on animals. So it, the same applies with you. Someone can hate you and declare you to be the worst person on earth in their opinion, but they have no right to take your rights away from you based on that to strip you of your rights of freedom, of liberty, of, of um, you know, basic, basic rights here we're talking about, to, to not be subjected to oppression, to, be, to not be subjected to violence. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that your affection towards animals or you know, how, however anyone feels towards animals has nothing to do with what we're talking about when we say that you have no right to stab animals to death for a sandwich, period. So this is only about justice for non-human animal rights. In the most summarized way possible, we would say veganism equals anti-animal abuse. Now I see some uh, people in the chat. Let me just have a look at that. Oh, no, that's fine. All right, so let's move on. So what is animal rights outreach? And I'll just define this from our perspective. What we mean when we say animal rights outreach is at its base, speaking up for the victims in the same way that you would want to be spoken for if you were in their position. We speak in a way that represents the reality for the victims. It is being a medium of truth and enacting change by prioritizing the victims in this whole scenario and not the oppressors. And in this scenario, humans are the oppressors. So when we talk about veganism, I need to further clarify that veganism is a movement that represents the victims that are being oppressed by humans. If you aren't speaking up for the animals in the same way that you would want to be spoken up for, then you aren't doing justice for the victims. The core of a successful outreach interaction is centered around holding individuals accountable for what they're personally responsible for and everything else is details. A lot of the times people, what they're used to doing, I guess, in society because society shapes people this way is saying that you need to focus on change within government structures or you need to protest corporations and the laws that 
corporations need to adhere to or the, just the way that corporations operate. They'll do anything and everything to avoid individual accountability, even though individuals are the ones creating the demand for these industries. Now, someone becoming vegan obviously doesn't mean that the industries are going to end. But at least what is happening in those industries or what is happening to animals is not going to be happening because of that individual anymore. And we need to focus on individual change just as much as we focus on any other type of change in society. If we can't change at the individual level, we need to forget about this revolution coming to fruition. It's not going to happen. And this speaks to what Katerina was talking about earlier. You can't manipulate people into becoming vegan. So if you think that you have like a special smooth way of speaking that is going to manipulate people into becoming vegan, forget about it. And I'll admit I've been there. I've tried to um, speak in a way that I thought would, you know, pull certain strings in order. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously interested in saying what is needed to be said in order to convince people to become vegan. But I used to use, um, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but I used to use a lot more of the methods that I learned in sales uh, and, you know, and certain ways of talking that I thought essentially could trick people into becoming vegan, you know, and, and what you will learn, the more you do outreach is that you cannot trick people into being vegan. You cannot manipulate people into being vegan. And by manipulate, I mean using disingenuous types of language and ways of talking. Manipulation is not necessarily a negative word in and of itself. But what we mean by this is to negatively approach manipulation in thinking that you can do that to get people to become vegan. It, it just does not work that way. There is no magic set of words to use during outreach that will make someone go vegan. Um, you know, Gary Urofsky said this a long time ago in a video, uh, and it still holds just as true now as it was when he said it initially. And it's that he, you can speak as calmly as Gandhi or as radical as early Malcolm X. At the end of the day, what it, what it really comes down to is the contents of what you've said and how true what you've said is or not. Now, I'm not suggesting that you, sh you, know, you can just be an outright dick to people and you can be very aggressive in the way that you speak, overly aggressive to people when, when you speak to them. I'm not saying that you can do that necessarily and it will work. What I'm saying is that what matters mostly in the whole outreach interaction is what you've said, how you've said it is to a degree important, but not necessarily as much as what you've said. And what matters the most, whether they're ready to listen to this message or not, where they're at in their lives currently, and whether they're opening, whether they're open rather to listening or not. Um, you know, we have to not just take what Gary Urofsky said as a grain of salt or, or a grain of sand, because he's done more outreach directly to people than anyone in this movement has. And he has tested the waters around, you know, saying advocate instead of, ad, instead of activist, saying plant-based instead of vegan, saying veg, saying, you know, certain words in order to make it sound less confronting or weird. And you know, in this video that he made quite a long time ago now, he stated very clearly that all of those things make very little difference. And what really, what it comes down to really is whether someone is ready to listen. You can do outreach perfectly to a hundred people and not all of them will go vegan. It, the, the only ones that will go vegan are the ones that are ready, the ones that are open. Your function as an activist is to hold the individual that you're speaking with accountable for the animal abuse that they are responsible for as individuals. And that's what you should just be simply focusing on when you're doing outreach. What we mean by planting seeds. Most people think that seed planting is verbally leafleting with points and questions that lack individual accountability. Did you know that chickens die at X number of weeks or months? 
Did you know that X number of animals are killed every year? Did you know that calves are taken away from their mothers at this age? Did you, these kinds of facts and figures and statistics, although they do have some merit in this type of conversation, the best type of seed that we can plant really is holding people responsible, holding them accountable. What we mean by seed planting is that the bystander leaves knowing that they are personally responsible for what we're showing them on the screens and what we're discussing with them. And that they must be vegan as of that day and nothing less is morally justifiable. So I spoke to this a little bit already regarding the why versus how, but this is a very important word that I want you to all get used to and, and really understand. Pandering, do not pander. It is so easy to fall into the habit of pandering because it's so common that people pander, especially in this movement. Pandering is when you are over agreeable on outreach and essentially you're being fake for the sake of being listened to or heard. Is it important to be polite and listen to what people are saying? Yes, of course it is. That's basic communication 101. However, if you find yourself agreeing with someone or nodding your head and saying, mm, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point you've just made. When they have just said plants have feelings, you are pandering. And that is not going to further the conversation or, or get to the point of them taking veganism seriously just because you've done that. It's actually losing their respect. Even if it's on a subconscious level, you are losing respect in that interaction because what they've said is not a good point if they really think that plants have feelings. What they've said is absolutely ridiculous. And let's move on. This approach is pure honesty. And I need to reiterate, because I, I said this before, and sometimes people confuse this with being dicks to people. We're not out on the streets trying to own people. I have no interest in doing that. And I hope that you have no interest in doing that either. We're not out there to be dicks. We're not out there to be aggressive for the sake of being aggressive. My understanding of the word aggressive is not necessarily the same as others. But my point is, is that we're not there to be overly aggressive in the way that we speak. We're not trying to um, come from this position of, of combativeness. What we're there to do is defend animals. And people will understand that and they'll know that your heart is in the right place if that's where you're coming from. So telling someone the truth is the most respectful thing that you can do for them. When you agree with every statement by the bystander, they will often lose respect for you and you will lose control of the conversation. They will manipulate you into thinking that they've gained respect for you. I can't tell you how common this is um, because they are glad that you're not holding them accountable for the obvious. This is why non-vegans like to say things like, I don't eat much meat and they'll only say that to vegans. But they often say that to us on the streets when we do outreach. And the reason why they say that is because they think uh, and what, often happens, unfortunately, is that the animal rights activists will say, oh, really, that's really good. And then we sort of let them off the hook. You know, we think we're talking to someone who just needs this tiny nudge when in fact, they eat just as much meat, dairy and eggs as everyone else. And so they don't need a softer approach. They need exactly the same approach as everybody else. And so non-vegans might not do this consciously. They might do it subconsciously. Um, but it's a very common tactic that people will use to get themselves off the hook. They'll say something along the lines of, yeah, I care a lot about animals. I only buy free range. I hardly eat any meat, et cetera. And if we play into that, we've basically shot ourselves in the foot. It's very common that humans will try to do whatever they can do to not be accountable, to not face this, because this is such an ugly reality to have to wake up to, right? Once you become vegan, then you're gonna start noticing all these trucks on the road full of animals. Uh, every time you drive your car, every time you walk out into the streets and you see one of these trucks, you're, you now have to be aware of this, fully facing the reality that this is the society we live in. 
This is the world that we live in. That is not a comfortable reality to wake up to. So most people would rather just keep their head in the sand and go along with what everyone else is doing in society. And, you know, ignorance is bliss when really ignorance is not bliss. Igno ignorance is violence. And, you know, waking up to the, to the ugly truth about yourself and what you're responsible for is something most people will want to avoid. But is the, it is the only chance that we have of people actually becoming vegan it is facing that, that reality for what it is. And that's why we focus on pure honesty. That is our most effective tool, truth. The reason why we have the word truth in the, in the cubes and only the word truth is because that is the most powerful weapon that we have. Bystanders will see that your desire to be validated by them is stronger than your desire to end animal cruelty at the hands of humans, thereby making a mockery of animal rights. Can you imagine if the primary goal of human rights activists was to be liked by the oppressors in any other situation? Um, it, 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 it actually is beyond distasteful to think that that's how we should approach this. Can it work in some cases? I'm sure it can, I'm sure it does. But when we look at it overall, do you think if you were the victim in this scenario, you would want people to do that? Going around trying to be socially comfortable and validated by the oppressors? I don't think so. I think you would want your rights to be fought for with vigor. So the basis of what we're saying here in this slide is to be honest with non-vegans in the language that you use. Being honest is, as your parents probably said to you, the best policy. You may be hesitant to speak boldly, and I understand it completely, because you may think that it will lead to um, people, it's very confronting. So you may think that people will become violent with you or become really aggressive towards you. And I am here to tell you that that rarely, that rarely happens. Why? Because you earn so much respect. And I mean, earn is the key word when you do speak boldly and honestly with people. You earn respect when they can sense you're coming from the right place. You're not just trying to be a dick. You're not just trying to be morally superior. You're speaking to defend the animals and they deserve to have that voice of, of bold honesty. They deserve to have that. And that truth is recognizable, even by non-vegans who have only just glimpsed, you know, for the first time at this issue for what it is. It's very obvious that that is the case, that these animals deserve to have a honest defense, uh, you know, an honest uh, voice on, on their side, you know. So whenever you are afraid to speak up for animals directly, or if bystanders call you to extreme, which is a form of gaslighting, place yourself in the victim's position and analyze your approach from their perspective. It's very simple once you put yourself in the animal's position. Would you consider a respectful yet direct conversation too extreme if you were locked in a slaughterhouse about to go down the kill line, get a bolt gun shot through your head and a knife shoved into your throat? Would it be too extreme to simply ask people to be accountable for their actions? Speaking boldly is the most effective approach in our experience of doing this. When you don't speak boldly, it's implied that veganism doesn't need to be taken seriously. You have to leave people feeling motivated. And the best way to have them feel motivated, to have a motive to do something, is to hold them accountable. I missed the last line there. They need to feel like there is no other option for them other than going vegan. And so you have to mirror their character back to them so that they feel the moral imperative. Uh, any other option than becoming vegan at that point is not even something that they can entertain. That's how they have to feel. Environment and health, whilst they are important in and of themselves, they're important movements, let's say. I, I would say the human health movement 
is important. I personally care about that for myself. Uh, I would say the environmental movement is very important. And I also care about that, you know, without driving myself crazy and, and being a complete minimalist, I don't think of myself as a complete minimalist. And I'm not even sure what the true definition of that is in this day and age. But my point is that I believe that these things are important. However, many issues in the world are important outside of animal rights. And they should not be conflated with animal rights because the animals deserve to have a movement that is dedicated to them. And when we don't speak about the animal rights issue, focusing on the animals, primary, fo focusing on them as the only reason why people need to go vegan, what we are suggesting is that that, that doesn't hold enough merit on its own, right? And that's, very, that's a very dangerous thing to be promoting. We don't want you to be talking about environment and health whilst you're at a cube of truth whilst you're doing animal rights outreach. If you wanna do this elsewhere, another time, in another conversation, I not only think that's cool, I encourage you to do that. I think that that's awesome that you wanna do that. But when you're talking about animal rights, just talk about animals and their rights. Do we even need to be using these stats to get this message across? Does it matter if it's the 10th greatest contributor or the 100th? greatest contributor let's say it doesn't contribute to any environmental damage does it actually have any bearing over the moral weight of this issue and this is the thing i'm not even sure what the real definition is of an environmentalist in this day and age if you live in a modern society does that mean you have to then go live in the jungle and you know live like a monk because they would have the smallest footprint. Does it mean you don't have the ability to drive cars or to Uber anywhere? Um, you know, what kind of transportation can you engage in? Those, these things aren't even clear for, you know, the environmentalist movement. It's not even necessarily clear. Um, so people who might claim to be environmentalists, they have a lofty idea of what it means to be. They might just simply say that because they recycle at home. And that's the extent of it. Um, but the point we're trying to make here is that the vast majority of people that you will speak to on the streets, they're not actually environmentalists anyway. And what we found also is that most people who think they are environmentalists, they really only care about the environment as far as it impacts human beings. And even more selfishly than that, they only really care about the environment as much as it will impact themselves and their families, not even the entire human species, but themselves and their families. So that is not to me, that is not to me like the actual idea of an environmentalist. Uh, that is still a very human supremacist, a human centric way of looking at it. They're not thinking about deer. They're not thinking about animals in the wild. They're thinking about how it impacts the human species or themselves and their families, right? So that's something to be mindful of when you are going down this path of like promoting environmentalism and conflating that with animal rights. Just remember that this, this is the society that we live in. If you do happen to speak with an environmentalist, they will likely feel like they're already doing enough. A lot of vegetarians feel this way too. If you ever feel compelled to advocate for environment or for human health, remember how you would like to be spoken for if you were in the victim's position, or if this was any other injustice, how do you think it should be spoken about? When you hand out the cards, we only want you to refer to Dominion, which is the latest and greatest documentary on what is happening to the animals. And it spans across the world with showing footage, not only from Australia, but around the world. And Gary Yurovsky's lectures. Um, and once again, I just want to highlight that we have the best speech you'll ever hear, which is his most successful speech at convincing people to be vegan, convince millions of people around the world to be vegan. Um, but we also have, for those who are willing to sink their teeth even deeper into this, we have the best of Gary Yurovsky's speeches and interviews um, and we've, we've 
put them all together in one video and it's and it is it's an ode to his work and i think it's the best parts of his work all put together in one video it's three plus hours to watch so it's not for everybody necessarily um, that's why we've also got the best speech you'll ever hear on there, which can be watched in many different languages, which is the other benefit of having that video there. But we only want you to refer to those videos, which really hammers home the why factor for people being vegan. All right, moving on. How to respond to health questions. If people do have health questions, it's important to assess whether they're being genuine or not. You know, are they really thinking in terms of how you can get enough iron or protein on a vegan diet? Are they like really challenged by this? Or is it just an excuse that they're bringing up in order to avoid being accountable? It's important for you to know that. Only entertain these arguments when the bystander brings them up. So don't talk about health at all unless they bring it up. And when you can sense that they are being genuine in their concern, I need to reiterate that. If they bring up health concerns, you can say something like, the science is on our side when it comes to plant-based diets being healthy. And there are plenty of vegan bodybuilders and athletes out there. If you have further concerns, Google is your best resource. Another thing I like to say is, I've been vegan for nearly 10 years. Do I look like I'm dying? If I, you know, a lot of people say, well, you can't get enough pro, you can't get enough iron, you can't get enough. Well, then I would have some kind of disease. I would be dying. How am I not dead? Why am I not dead? If that's the case, you know, like just keeping it simple like that is oftentimes as complex as you need to get with this. You don't need to get into the science necessarily of, of nutrient levels in plants and stuff like that. Leaning on the intelligence of people and assuming that they can figure this out on their own just by using Google. If someone has concerns about the effects of eating a plant-based diet on the environment, just remind them that environmentalism is a separate discussion from animal rights. And then once you've addressed this, check in with the bystanders to see if their concerns have been eased or not. You know, you can just simply ask them, you know, are you satisfied with that, with that answer? So like when we focus on plant-based recipes, restaurants, weight loss, or deforestation, we are implying that animal rights doesn't stand on its own merit strong enough. It doesn't have enough moral weight in and of itself. So we have to talk about these other things to, to dress it up, to make it more convincing. Another reason is that a lot of vegans lead with phrases like friends, not food, animal lovers don't eat animals. And I've already touched on this, so I won't go any further into this type of language and why it's problematic. This is not a conversation about sympathy. This is a conversation about accountability. So when you're comparing to other injustices to highlight the severity of this injustice, what we've found is the most effective comparison that you can make of all these comparisons is to simply place the non-vegan that you're speaking with in the victim's position. Because what we found is that people mostly care about themselves. Of all the things that humans care about, they mostly care about themselves. And they're not gonna truly understand how wrong something is until they are placed in that position. So the best chance we have is to get them just for a moment to imagine what it would be like to be in the victim's position. Outside of what is asked of you, state minimal information during outreach conversations. We're not there on the streets to verbally leaflet. Um, whilst we can win these debates, whilst we can win these arguments using stats and logic in a linear fashion, uh, we're there to get people to change. And the best way we have found to get people to change is to use some logic when it's needed, when they bring up things to respond to their things. Um, it's good to use some logic, but this is more about hitting them in the, in the chest, in, in the gut, not in the head. Because our minds are so programmed, but truth hits you here. You aren't at a cube of truth to be a statistician. 
we're there to simply have a concise conversation with the small amount of time that we have with people that holds them accountable for the unjustified animal abuse that they are responsible for many times a day. If you're not vegan, multiple times a day, you are engaging in this oppression. A conversation will go on for longer than necessary if it turns into an argument over statistics. There is another reason why you, pardon me, this is another reason why you shouldn't bring up health and environmental talking points. Reachability and conversation length. So again, I, I spoke about this somewhat already, but this is, this is important for you to properly understand. Not everybody on the streets is worth talking to. So, you know, when we're out on the streets, our line of work focuses on only speaking to people who stop. And that is a way for us to filter through the public to know that the person that we're speaking to is more open-minded than the others that just walk on by, right? And so why do we do that? Because we're trying to find out who amongst these people out on the streets are actually open, are, are ready. And so um, much of our work is also about knowing once you know that someone is not um, open, first of all, it's about knowing whether they're open or not and willing to change or not. Um, and, it's, and it is quite easy the more you do this to get a good read on people. There are, there are signs that will reveal themselves to you. It's just as important for you in your work to end the conversation with those who are not reachable as it is to start a conversation with those who are reachable. You know, so that's important for you to understand that you don't necessarily need to talk to everybody. You don't need to spend, you know, you don't need to spend a great deal of time with people if you if you if if 30 seconds into the interaction you've worked out that the person's not reachable any more time you spend with them beyond that 30 seconds is a waste of your time so it's important for you to know okay i need to end this i need to wrap this up and then make myself available to speak with somebody else asap asap and that is often the best message that you'll send to that individual when you essentially say there was a vegan today that you spoke with who was not willing to engage in your nonsense, right? Because a lot of the times non-vegans who aren't reachable will try to get one up on you. And the longer that you entertain it and the longer you waste your time with them, they will, it will further cement this feeling of them having one up over a vegan. And um, often the best message is to, to, to send to them at that point is that you aren't willing to engage. Again, part of your role is to assess who is reachable and who is not. And many people are not reachable. Many people are reachable. And that's why our work is so effective because there are so many people out there that are reachable. And so our work is to find those people and be good at identifying those people. If they want to have a short conversation with you, keep it short with them. Don't try to force it. Don't try to force the conversation. Don't um, ask people to come over and to stop and to talk to you or try to keep them for longer because if they're not, if they're trying to get away from you, if they're trying to keep the conversation short with you, that is a sign that they're not ready. They're not willing. They're not open. They're not reachable. Don't entertain bystanders who want to engage in long argumentative debates. We're not there to debate. This is very simple. We can win those debates, but that isn't going to get someone to necessarily become vegan. I don't know how many hours I've wasted of my life just listening to these debates online and also engaging in debates with people that just go nowhere. You think, you know, you can give them all the right answers. You can completely destroy their arguments, but at the end of the day, is that person reachable or not? Do not underestimate the cunningness of non-vegan guilt and the ability that many non-vegans have to waste your vital time at work for the animals. Their human supremacy rearing its ugly head. 
X number of years in sales does not equal X number of years in activism. I think it's important to have your hands behind your back when you're talking to people. It shows that you're not in a defensive stance, but all of this doesn't matter that much. If you are standing with your hands by your side or your hands crossed in front of you, it's not going to uh, change all that much because like I said before, what this mainly comes down to is whether the person is open and reachable or not. So don't trip too much on things like that. Socratic questioning is a communication tool that we use in our approach. It's a good way of speaking to their intelligence, ask questions that lead the bystander to their own conclusions. Instead of saying, um, so, so here's the example, use open-ended questions such as, why are you against animal abuse? Instead of a closed statement such as, animal abuse is wrong. It's important to engage people in the interaction. Open-ended questions are generally preferred to anchor and progress the conversation. However, you should use closed-ended questions and statements. So it's important to know the timing. Is it the time to be asking an open-ended question or is it the time to be asking a closed-ended yes or no question? Or is it the time to be making a statement? It's important to know that statements are are equally as effective and they help to anchor the conversation and push the conversation forward. Why versus how? I've spoken about this, but let's get further into it. People already know how to go vegan because we live in the age of information. We live in the age of having a device on you at all times. We live in the age of Google. With the constant availability of Google and the internet, Anybody can figure out how to become vegan instantly. In order for people to feel the need to become vegan, they need to be held accountable for why they should do it. With any other injustice, you would never focus on the how by talking about how to not participate in the violence. Focusing on the how in the context of any other injustice would be an insult to the victims and to the entire movement fighting to end their oppression. Again, if you were in the victim's position, would you want people to say things about how easy it is to avoid it and focus on that primarily and then maybe secondarily or eventually getting to the moral imperative, the ethics, the fact that it's wrong to be oppressing you? Just think about it from the victim's point of view here. Vegetarians are non-vegans. They're non-vegans and should be outreached in the same manner as anyone else. And in most cases, they're even harder to speak to. So it is, in most cases, even more of a reason for you to go harder on those individuals, not to back up, not to go softer and to go easier on them, but to go even harder on them. In most cases, vegetarians are pompous. They turn their nose up. They think they're already doing enough. How dare you tell them any different? How many times have you heard vegetarians say to you, don't worry about me, I'm on your side, I'm vegetarian. And then when you say, yes, but we're showing you the dairy industry and the egg industry. Oh yes, but I'm doing my part. You know, you can't expect everybody so that why do we never have non-vegans coming up to us saying, don't worry, I'm on your side. I'm a non-vegan, a fake version of veganism where people feel like they are standing for the rights of animals, that they're defending animals in some way without actually having to do so, right? It is, it is even more of a problem than people who outrightly eat meat because at least those people don't think that they are defending animals. They don't think that they are in, deserve to be in the same conversation as vegans. They don't think that, whereas vegetarians do. So there is even more of a, of, of a perspective change that needs to happen with vegetarians. They are no different to carnivores. Most vegetarians are responsible for just as much animal abuse as carnivores. Why should we treat them any different? And I'd like to hear from you in the Q&A if you'd like to speak to this or any of these points, but this, this tends to come up in my Q&As. Vegetarians are not allies. Don't let other vegans or non-vegans 
manipulate you into thinking that they are. And I'll, I'll, I'll end this slide here with one point that I like to make, which is that those who eat a paleo diet do not consume any dairy. Those who are vegetarians don't consume any meat. They just simply do not um, consume one group, one type of animal product, right? What is the difference between the paleo crowd and the vegetarian crowd, right? People who don't consume dairy are not engaging in one of the cruelest industries on the earth, right? And a lot of vegans argue that the dairy industry is perhaps the cruelest to land animals on earth. And paleo, people who are eating a paleo diet aren't responsible for that, right? Would we ever say that the paleo crowd are our allies? People who eat a paleo diet, like they're in the same conversation as vegans, vegan slash paleo? Does that make any type of logical sense whatsoever? Of course not. So what is the difference, right? Paleo people still wear leather. Paleo people still eat eggs. They still engage in every other form of animal oppression, just like vegetarians. They only avoid one type of animal cruelty. That doesn't get them off the hook. That concludes the slides. And I'm going to move on to a flow chart now. So um, I've covered the foundation for the outreach approach. And now I'm going to show you um, the flow of the interaction. You are only approaching people who stop. And it's important that they stop and they start to watch the footage before you engage with them. Now, the opening question used to be, um, would you like to know more about why we're here? Or have you seen this footage before? If you've heard those opening questions before, I'd like you to consider this upgrade. Um, the question that we now recommend you use is how does this footage make you feel? The reason why I've changed this is because I found that this question, how does this footage make you feel? It gets the same answer as would you like to know more about why we're here? And have you seen this footage before? You generally get the answer that you're looking for anyway by asking this question. And the reason why this question is so important is because we wanna start the interaction at the level of feeling and not at the level of logic. We wanna we want get them here because, um, and you know, I'm gonna go back to sales very quickly here to just play on the fact that, um, to, to my point that there are some tools, there are some things to learn from sales. One of the key things is the traditional approach for convincing someone of something is to first um, connect them to the emotion, to get them emotionally convicted, to get them convicted in what you're saying, right? And that doesn't come from, it may involve some logic and reason, but it comes from emotional conviction mainly. Then the next step is to make it about that individual, to not make it about something outside of themselves, which is where accountability comes in and why accountability is so important. And then finally to tie in the benefits. So that's you know, the basis of, of the process to convince someone of something. So we start off with the emotion. How does this footage make you feel? Because it's important that you understand how people feel about what's going on to the animals. Um, now, if people are open-minded, they will say something along the lines of, um, this is horrible, this is bad, it makes me feel sad. Um, you know, it, it, they'll say something along those lines. Now, if they are not reachable, they'll say something like, doesn't make me feel like anything. Um, or they'll try to be a smart ass or they'll try to be, um, you know, they'll try to sound like they don't care. And they'll say, well, you know, this is just life, you know, like who cares? This is just the way the world works. Um, so it's important to ask them if that's how they really feel. Um, and if they are telling you with conviction that that's how they feel, you may either be talking to a troll or you're talking to someone who is closed minded. You're not talking to someone who is reachable. Um, if you are talking to someone who's closed minded and they say, well, this is just how the world works or you know, I don't give a shit, that's fine. Bacon is yummy. It's important for you to wrap up the interaction. Don't try to bleed it out of them or force them 
beyond that point. Because in, in my experience and in many other people's experience that I have learned from at the cubes, you are wasting your time beyond that point. It's better for you to make yourself available for someone else. Now, if they do give you some type of affirmative answer that tells you that they have the correct emotional response to this, um, then you would move on to educating them about what they're showing. You have to give them some education about what you're showing on the screen. What we're showing you is the behind the scenes of industries that abuse animals, such as meat, dairy, egg, and the fish industries. All of the footage that is being shown is standard practice and includes humane slash RSPCA certified. If you don't have the RSPCA in your country, they are essentially the animal organization, the biggest animal organization that is known for defending animals when they don't really defend animals. So you don't have to say, you don't even have to refer to the organization, but here in this country, in Australia, it's the RSPCA. It's also the RSPCA, I believe, in the UK. And then it's the SPCA in Canada. You don't even have to, you could just say humane certified because this is a global problem where animal products have that stamp on them that says humane certified. And that's essentially what the RSPCA label tries to mean as well. Um, so once you've given them, given them that little bit of education, you move on to say, um, is it safe to say that you're against animal abuse? Because if they've said something, you know, that is the correct emotional response to what they're watching, like this is horrible, it makes me feel sad, then it's important to then ask a closed ended question to just further clarify that their stance when it comes to this is that they are against what they're watching. So is it safe to say that you are against animal abuse? Um, usually they will say yes, by the way. Um, even if you're talking to a hunter, even if you're talking to someone who is a hardcore non-vegan, they will oftentimes say to you, of course I'm against animal abuse. Without question, without doubt, I am 100% totally and completely against animal abuse. So it's important to clarify that. And then you move on to the third part here. This question is very important because it starts to get down to the bottom of accountability, to the core of the issue, the root of the problem. Do you think it's possible to be against animal abuse while consuming animal products such as meat, dairy, fish, and eggs? You could just say meat, dairy, and eggs because fish is meat, but you get the point. Do you think it's possible to be against animal abuse while consuming animal products such as meat, dairy, and eggs? And while you're saying that, point to the footage on the screen. Um, now, if someone is being genuinely uh, intellectually um, honest, they'll say, no, I don't think it's possible. I think it's hypocritical. If someone is genuinely confused on this, maybe they're not trolling. Maybe they think there is a way to care about animals and to, and to be against animal abuse whilst eating meat, dairy, and eggs. They'll, they'll offer you an excuse and we'll get into the circle of excuses here. They'll either say, no, I don't think it's possible. You are a hypocrite if you eat animals while saying that you're against animal abuse or they'll give you an, an objection, an excuse, okay? Now, I'm not gonna get into each of these. This is just what we call the circle of excuses. And it's here to just highlight that you will get given one of these types of excuses. And the goal that your, your, your goal as an outreacher is to address the objection, but to do it very quickly and then continue on with the outreach protocol. Once you address the objection, it's important for you to get right back to the protocol, the line of questioning, the, the, the process in this approach. And it's important to anchor it back to that as soon as possible. So ad address the objection quickly and get back to accountability. Put the non-vegan in the victim's position. It's, it's the best way to address any excuse, pretty much. Uh, when you sense that the person is not open to having their thoughts challenged, ask, are you open to being wrong about this? So instead of engaging in these long argumentative debates, you can just simply say, are you open to being wrong about this? 
Or are you open to the fact that vegans have considered this before? Just remember that you are in control of the conversation. Don't let them control the conversation or distract you. Because at the end of, of the day, if you do that, you are letting them off the hook and you're sending a very ineffective and, and weak message across. So you address the objection. If you guys have any specific objection you need help with, let me know in the Q&A and, and we can get into that. But the idea here that I want you to understand is that you address the objection quickly and get back to the accountability aspect, get back to the approach. Okay, now step number four is clarifying if their excuse um, has been addressed satisfactorily for them. What do you feel is stopping you from not abusing animals anymore and going vegan today? Um, now, hopefully they'll say nothing really is stopping me. And that's, that's the truth of it for everybody. Um, and once you ask them that question, um, let's say they say something like, well, I just don't think that I can get the right types of nutrients. Again, you can address that in the way that we've already spoken about in that slide where we said the information is on Google. It's the, the science is on our side. It's perfectly adequate for you to be vegan. Um, once you've addressed that, then you'll move on to step number five. Do you know the number one benefit of being vegan? Right? So this is where you're, you're now um, progressing through the steps here and you're almost at the finish line. You're almost at the end of this interaction at this point. It, it, it is a very quick way of getting to the point. Do you know the number one benefit of being vegan? And they'll say, mm, now, a lot of the times actually, and this points out the fact that you don't need to be talking about health and environment. A lot of the times people will say, well, you definitely live longer. It's healthier for you to be vegan or it's better for the environment. It's certainly better for the environment for you to be vegan. And that just proves it. We don't need to be educating people about the health and environmental aspects. They already know. They already know about this in 2022. They've known about this for many years now, actually. Um, but anyway, some people will, will also say, well, it's good for the animals, right? Because you're no longer hurting them anymore. Um, and that's the ideal answer. The way that we would break it down for them is we'll say, for the animals, they no longer have to be abused and killed needlessly for you. You are no longer the reason that they are subjected to unimaginable torture. And for you, you said that you're against animal abuse. So when you become vegan, you will no longer be a hypocrite. And then I want you to just pause. After you make these points, give it time to breathe. Let the point set in properly. And, you know, you will be very hard pressed to find anyone that will disagree with you once you've said this. And generally what happens is you earn a great deal of respect from the individual because you're pointing out something that is inarguable. It is undeniable. And what you're doing in that moment is you are mirroring their character back to them. That is what accountability is all about. You know, when you're holding someone accountable, you can't force them to literally change. All you can do is mirror their character, their own values back to them. That's why these questions are important. And that's what makes this so effective is that is the best chance we have of actually making people go vegan is putting their character on trial. So um, once you have made that point about the benefit, the, the fact that they'll no longer be a hypocrite, the fact that they'll no longer be the reason that animals suffer unimaginably, the sixth step is to say, if you were in the animal's position, how urgent would you want this to end? This is an important question because even at this point, a lot of people will think, maybe you're right, but like, I'll take my... I'll take my time, you know, baby steps, right? Um, a lot of people at this point will say, yeah, you know what? I am going to try to make some changes. I will start reducing. I'll start slowly and eventually becoming vegan. And so it's important for you to point out the urgency. And the best way to do that is to simply ask from the victim's position, 
How urgently would you want this to end? Step number seven. There's only seven steps in all of this, by the way, guys. Um, the seventh step is after our conversation, are you going to stop abusing animals and go vegan? And this is when they'll generally say, you know, if they're not totally convinced to be vegan as of that moment, they'll generally say, well, I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to reduce something along those lines. And then this is where you tie it in and you, you close it off by saying, remember, this is not food for thought. This is injustice. And this injustice is an urgent matter for as long as you take to go vegan. These animals are abused and killed because of you. Once you've gone vegan, please also speak up and defend animals. I like to also say if they say I'm going to try, and this has been a very effective way of tying in the urgency, I would say, I'm glad that you've said that. However, would you agree that this is an injustice? And usually they'll say, yes, it is an injustice. And then I will say, in any other injustice, um, or if you were the victim in this injustice, would you find it acceptable for your oppressor to try to harm you less or to eventually stop harming you? Or would you want them to stop harming you immediately? And that generally what that does is it addresses this lack of urgency that they're, that they're showing at this point. So that is the entire approach. Um, that's the long and the short of it. Um, I've just taken you from saying hello to having them taking veganism seriously in seven short steps. These interactions can be as short as two minutes, right? Or they can be as long as 20 minutes. It depends on like what kind of excuses they want to bring up and but I wouldn't be spending 20 minutes with someone unless I was really convinced that they were reachable, that they were worth the time. But you can do this approach in a very short period of time. And it's important for you to know that for the sake of sustainability in your activism, you wanna be doing this for a long time. You wanna be able to reach as many people as possible and it's important to know how to do that in a short period of time in the interaction so that you aren't burning yourself out and banging your head up against a wall with people that aren't reachable and wasting your time on saying things that are not effective. I appreciate you guys being here and learning about this. And it's important that you go away from this workshop feeling inspired, feeling confident in this approach. Um, so we start off by saying, hello, how does this footage make you feel? We're showing you the behind the scenes footage of industries that abuse animals, such as the meat, dairy, and egg industries. All the footage is standard practice and includes humane certified, et cetera. Is it safe to say that you're against animal abuse? Do you think it's possible to be against animal abuse while consuming animal products such as meat, dairy, and eggs? What do you feel is stopping you from not abusing animals anymore and going vegan today? Do you know the number one benefit of being vegan? If you were in their position, how urgently would you want this to end? After our conversation, are you going to stop abusing animals and go vegan? And I won't read that last part because um, that's, it's not necessary that you say this. It's just there as a nice cap off. And it's important to remember that you are anchoring the conversation. You are in charge of the interaction from start to end. Don't entertain distractions, deflections, and irrelevant questions. Focus only on the animals, not on environment and not on human health. Refocus, bring it back to the animals and hold them individually accountable. Be ready to end the conversation if you judge that they are not open. Organizational reminders, end the conversation with trolls, unreceptive and closed-minded people quickly. Let people watch the footage first, even if it's just for a good moment before you approach them. We need to know that they are showing some type of interest or that they're showing some type of um, sign that they're reachable. Don't interrupt other out if any, anyone else is doing outreach, don't interrupt their interaction. It's important that 
it's always one person having an interaction with as many people as they're interacting with. It could be a whole group of people, but if they're, if they're correctly engaging with everybody, it should only be that one outreacher dealing with all of those people. So don't interrupt and don't join them unless you are asked to come over for some reason and speak to other people there. We are there for the animals when we're doing animal rights outreach. Please keep the socializing for after the cube. Now I know that it can be really, it's really difficult to not engage in social conversations when you're at the cube sometimes because, you know, some people are only seeing animal rights activists when they're at a cube. And so, you, you know, you may wanna to talk to them about how things are going in their lives. You know, you may have a friendship with them, but please try to keep the socializing for after the cube. Or if you are talking to each other at the cube, please only keep the conversations about outreach, about what's happening at the cube. And the whole point that we are trying to make here is that we have to be, um, aware of how we're being perceived by the public. If they see us standing around and talking, it sort of looks like we're casually standing there and not really engaged in the work that we're doing. And we've found that the more serious that we take our roles on the streets, the more serious people take us. And most people don't take vegans seriously. So we're trying to change that. All right. Um, that's basically it. Um, you know, we need to focus on individual accountability. We put people in the position of the victims. Um, and we, we don't want to get too caught up in, in the heads of people, in the, the logic and the reason. Um, it really, the best way to get through to people's minds is, is by hitting them in the chest with the truth. And that concludes my workshop, guys. This has been the Holding On Vegans Accountable 3.0 workshop. I hope that this has been valuable to you in some way. Now we're going to open up the Q&A. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna open the floor to you guys. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Let me know what you think and let me know what your questions are. Just remember to raise your hand, whether physically, if you're on camera or you can do so by using the platform. All right, Devor, I hope I'm saying your name right. Yeah, no, I really don't have any questions. I just want to say thank you so much for this and for structuring so clearly. And I just am amazed how it's really so well structured. It's a golden piece of information. I wish all vegans and activists would follow such an effective and, 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 and professional approach. And I, I hope everybody listening here and, and our, our activists in our chapter and all around the world will strive to really follow this because it's really, it really shows how effective this is and how easy can it be when you approach this in a well-structured and professional manner. So thank you, Paul, so much. Uh, thank you a lot, Davo. Appreciate that. Charlotte? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask you whether you have um, any tips on conversations with uh, religious people or people referring to uh, halal slaughtering methods or something like that? Yeah, so my, gen I mean, my general advice is that, again, are you speaking to someone who's reachable or not? Um, I found that most religious people are not going to be convinced by someone who's not religious or someone who is not of their religion. And even if you are someone of their religion, um, you're a fellow Christian, you're a fellow Buddhist, a fellow Muslim, um, it's still going to be incredibly difficult for you to convince them on the basis of arguing from the religious point of view. You know, in the Quran, in the Bible, um, you know, it says, and, you know, you try to convince them based on their own religion. I found that that's almost entirely ineffective. Um, you're not going to convince them that way. The only line, and this comes from the OG Gary Roski, uh, the only line that I found that will really work from that point of view, if anything is going to work, is saying, if this is the work of God, if God finds this acceptable, what does the devil do? Right? 
if anything is going to shake them out of that belief that this is acceptable morally because my God tells me it's okay, if anything has a chance that that line is going to have the best chance, I think. However, I go back to my original point. Uh, is the person that you're talking to reachable or not? Um, you know, halal is no different to the slaughter that we're showing on the screens. In fact, some of the footage that we show um, includes halal. Um, the best way to address that is by putting them in the victim's position. Do you think that if I were to slice your throat, no matter how I did it, do you think that that is morally acceptable? Do you think that that would be acceptable to you? Of course not, no matter how it's done. We are not there as welfareists trying to promote another way to do this because there is no morally acceptable way to do this. Um, there is no requirement for you to do this. You can still be a good Christian, a good Buddhist, a good Muslim um, whilst being vegan. We don't need to argue from the basis of their religion and it being better for them according to their religion. We just need to simply say you're not mandated, you're not required to participate in this bloodbath, in this bloodshed in order to be a good Christian or a good Muslim or a good Buddhist, etc. So um, back to my original point, is the person that you're talking to reachable or not? That's what this will come down to. This is very reasonable. It's very undebatable. It's very easy to get your head around once you put yourself in the victim's position. Um, and of course, opting for a way of living that is not violent towards animals, that is, that is certainly reducing the suffering that you're responsible for as a human being, is going to be seen as it's obviously a lot better than their current choice of not being vegan. So it's not going to be hard for you to convince someone that is reachable when it comes to religious people. It's not going to be hard at all. You don't even have to say much. So it really comes down to whether they're reachable or not. Does that satisfy your question, Charlotte? Yes, thank you. That was very helpful. You're welcome. All right. Arizon? Hi, Paul. <clears throat> um, I don't have a question, just a few comments. First, I want to thank you so much. That was very, you touched on a lot of truth there and you've, you've added to the fire I have in my chest. I have a cube neck, so thank you. I want to give an example of, of why what you said today is so true. So I was speaking with a, a vegetarian girl recently, and she told me that she stopped eating meat for all of these reasons, and she wants to go vegan when she moves out, when she goes to university. And the first thing I said, I, I, I said, it, it's a great um, goal that you have to go vegan and then she gave um, some reasons some details like you, you you mentioned and then I I held her accountable I reflected her character on back to her and I and I asked her a question I said in these two years let's say until you move out let's say there are a hundred mother cows that will lose their children hundreds of children that will lose their mothers in this time are you, are, you, are you saying with your actions that you value that more than you value cheese, let's say? And she got very, very aggressive. This is one thing I'll tell all the activists here. Don't expect them to, to, to be happy when you tell them this. Like you said as well, she was, she went, the conversation just went through the roof, but I stayed calm and she was asking me, she was telling me, oh, you don't know my personal life. You don't know what I have to deal with with my family. And again, I used empathy. I used the sales tactic. I said, I really do empathize. I explained to you before, I know how it is as a child in your parents' home. But is the suffering or the difficulty that your parents are causing you more than the suffering and difficulty we are causing the animals? And then again, mm -hmm. she really couldn't answer me. And in the end, she, she blocked me. This was a uh, outreach on Instagram and mm. I, I could have stopped she asked me to stop that's how that's how like intense it got and I think in those intense moments that's when you need to stay the strongest because there's something happening in them 
there's a truth that they are seeing and of course the truth is very uncomfortable so yeah i'll just um finish off but that that is an example and the last comment i'll make to, to other activists so a reason why i think people feel this concern to make bystanders feel bad is because there's an assumption that the bystander is too weak and then they're, mm. they're too almost pathetic to to handle the truth mm. and um, and we need to remind ourselves they're not just a random person that we've dragged off the street. This is the first thing. They are an adult and they've stopped and they're willing to speak with us. So they clearly have some sort of interest to speak with you. And a question I'll end off with, what if they are actually strong? What if they can actually handle it? What if they don't want you to pander and act like, oh, you can't handle it? Perhaps they have something deep down where they, they want you to tell them the truth. And it might be a, almost a breath of fresh air for them to be treated like an adult. Sure, there, there will be um, automatic, negative, aggressive responses. This is the process of accepting any truth. Um, and just to be mindful, maybe we are projecting our own insecurities onto them. Mm -hmm. And by telling them the truth, we're giving power to that individual. Mm -hmm. That's a huge point you just ended that on we are projecting our own beliefs into that interaction. That is the, 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 that is the whole reason why we take it so easy on people and we think that they can't handle it. And that we think that um, there's gonna be this confrontation that we have to deal with that may lead to violence or that they aren't gonna be able to, like they're gonna feel so horrible and then, then that's gonna push them away from veganism. That is a total projection and, um, you know, I like to say, you know, if you have good, um, if you have honorable morals when it comes to friendship, then you'll know you shouldn't lie to your friends. But if you simply extend that to the public, then what you're doing is you're showing love to the, to the stranger that you're talking to. Um, you're showing love to them in a similar way that you would show love to your friends. Because when you're honest to your friends, when you're honest to people, that is the most respectful, the most loving thing that you can do. Even if the truth that you're, that you're sharing with them is not comfortable, it is not going to be met with, um, it's not necessarily going to be met with positivity, with, with, a, with a sense of um, cheer, like they're not going to be smiling when they hear you say it necessarily. It's not a bowl of cherries necessarily. What you're telling them is probably gonna make them feel uncomfortable. I mean, let's face it, we're addressing so something that is extremely ugly. The longest and largest form of oppression on earth and humans are responsible for it and can so easily not be responsible for it. It is such an ugly, truth why would we expect to be met with smiles and cheer right so but like what i found and what many people that, that do this approach within the av network have found is that you earn a great deal of respect when you simply tell people the truth and get to the core of the issue the, the source of the problem uh without beating around the bush without pandering without you know doing these other things that we've spoken about so let's move on to bruno thank you for sharing those thoughts with us arizon my pleasure thank bruno. you Paul. yeah so often when i have a good conversation with someone uh i'm like debunking their arguments and those stuff and then i draw comparisons from animals to humans like would you be okay if, you, if you, we did it to humans like i draw comparisons to like slavery rape yeah stuff like that. And then they come out like, you just can't compare humans to animals. And yeah, when I like ask them why, you know, can you explain why uh, they just don't know or give some something like they, something stupid, stupid that they even know it's stupid. So what would you suggest I do in that situation? Uh, would you suggest? Yeah, okay. 
Yes, so that's that's a fair question. So yeah, some what what you will find is at that moment you'll find that the reason why they're caught up, the, the, their main excuse is human supremacism. They are a human supremacist. They believe that humans are supreme to all other beings, and that in and of itself gives humans the right to do unimaginably cruel, unimaginably violent things to non-human animals for no other reason you know might makes right that's you know as an extension of that of that belief back to what i was saying in the workshop the best chance you have of getting through to those people is by having them imagine what they're saying happening to them uh, putting them in the victim's position not the whole human species but them as an individual you know, if you were if you were being stabbed to death unnecessarily, if you were being oppressed, tortured, and murdered unnecessarily, would this excuse that you're using be justified? Would this line of thinking be acceptable? And then, you know, if they continue to carry on about the fact that you know you're talking about non-human animals, you're not talking about humans. Um, I just simply like to say. Of course, there are differences between the two species, but at the end of the day, humans are animals. And if they're not willing to agree with that, of course, you're talking to someone who is not reasonable and is, not, and is most likely not reachable. If, they're just, if they are completely unable to see that we are of the animal kingdom, at least biologically, and that's the reason why we can, we can relate, that we can empathize, we can understand, what is happening to non-human animals, um, you're talking to someone who's not reachable most likely. So what you're touching on is someone who most likely is coming from the point of view that um, they are a human supremacist. That is the main excuse they have for not being vegan. And you're, you're either speaking to someone who's open and, and reachable in that regard and understanding that you don't need to even agree that non-human animals are the same as humans. We're not even arguing that. We're not saying that. All we're saying is there are comparisons to be drawn. And in all of the ways that truly matter, non-human animals are comparable to us. They suffer in all the ways that truly matter, just like we do. And that's the reason why we're making that comparison. We're not saying that we're equal in all ways. We're saying that <clears throat> in all of the ways that matter, that comparison matters. <clears throat> so again, um, and I'm, I'm going to repeat myself here when it comes to addressing excuses. This always comes down to whether the person you're speaking to is reachable or not. Because if they are reachable, you don't have to say much in, re in response in your reply. You will see... Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to name names here, but you'll see activists who give these long drawn out responses and debunk and, and, and give great rebuttals to these excuses. And they could be the most well-versed activists. They could be the most knowledgeable and emphatic in how they address it at every single time, whether it was effective or not comes down to how reachable the other person was. And so, that is the main thing I want you to remember here. Um, if people can't get on board with understanding why you're making that comparison and asking them to imagine being in the victim's position, how would you feel if this was happening to you? If they can't even just imagine that for a moment and aren't open to doing that, you're probably not talking to someone who's very reachable. When we are addressing any injustice, we have to assess it from the victim's point of view, which not many people like to do, but it's necessary to understand the severity of the injustice. Does that satisfy your question, Bruno? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, I got it. All right, all right, let's move on to, oh God, I don't know who was next, so forgive me, I'm just gonna pick you, Sandra. Yeah, my question is about people who are saying that, uh, yeah, if animals are, are killed quick and they don't feel anything, then that's okay. And I often, I always say to them, yeah, if I would shot you and it would be quick and they don't feel anything, that how would you think about it? And then 
I had several people now who then said, yeah, that would be okay with them because then they, they are dead anyway and nothing would matter to them anymore. So how so, can so, I answer that? Well, would you not agree, Sandra, that that person is clearly not reachable? Do you think there is anything that we could say to that that would get through to them? Mm -hmm. Right? Beyond, beyond saying, well, I mean, that's easy to you, it's easy for you to say because you're in this scenario, you're the oppressor, right? It's easy to take this position of you not caring. But if it was happening to you, I don't think you're being honest. Uh, if this was happening to you, I think you would have a problem with it, right? And if that doesn't get through yeah. to them and they want to continue trolling, because at this point they are just trolling, if they want to continue on trying to make you believe that they don't care, you're talking to someone that's clearly not open and reachable. This is why I've made such an emphasis in this workshop, this new update on how reachable the person you're speaking to is. Because our arguments can be rock solid and 100% undebatable, but is the per person you're speaking to reachable or not? Because that's what it's gonna come down to at the end of the day. If they really think that you taking out a gun and shooting them is not a moral issue to them, come on. They're clearly trolling. There's no way you're going to get through to them, right? Yeah. I mean, what, yeah. what do we have to, the only thing that's going to get through to them is if you actually took out a gun and put it to their heads, right? And then that maybe they'll understand how serious the issue is then, right? But like, we're not going to do that because we're all going to end up in jail if we do that. So my point is, if, you, if they're not willing to imagine that actually playing out in real life for them as the victim, the, you're talking to someone who's not open. Do you okay. agree or disagree? Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank All you. right. Let's. Move on. You're welcome, Louisa. I have a few, few questions. Uh, for example, at the beginning we were talking about the tactic manipulation, using some kind of a strategy and so on. I think mm -hmm. this is clear. Being honest is the best way of to, to reach our goal, to, to reach the people. I'm not sure, but um, for being clear, uh, yes. The flow chart that you you just uh, show us show us this is some kind of tactic. This is some kind of a strategy, and I think that's cool. It's a good, a very good way to do it. So, um, a tactic or a strategy is not it's not bad itself. So, what do you mean exactly? Which are the don't? Which are the no goes that we should never do? What do you mean? Uh, well, I thought I clarified this during the workshop, but what I was trying to say is that. Um, you know, you trying to focus on a magic set of words that manipulate people, and I mean to use that word in, in the negative sense of the word, um, is not going to get people to take veganism seriously. Our approach is very nuts and bolts. And what I mean to say that it's very, it's very, um, um, it's principle, it's based on principle. You know, you don't have to say everything exactly the same way that I would say it when I'm pointing out the benefit, for example. And, you know, I have a certain way of pointing out the benefit in terms of the animal's perspective and then the benefit from the individual's perspective that we're speaking to. Um, you don't have to say it exactly the same way, but if you follow the principle and you point those things out, then you're doing this approach. So. Um, that's what we mean is that you don't have to necessarily say things exactly the same. There's no like magic set of words or special approach necessarily to this. All that we teach, all that I'm teaching you in this workshop is what has worked in the past in my experience and in the experience of many activists and of those who have been doing this for much longer than we have been doing it. And we're just putting it all together like a tapestry for you to learn from what is tried and true and what are the nuts and bolts. So I, 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 I'm not saying that this, I, I've, I thought I clarified in this workshop that this is an approach, right? You do need to have an approach. Um, there is a protocol, there is a flow that you should follow. Um, but the point I'm trying to make when I say, don't think that you can come up with some magic set of words to negatively, uh, again, I'm using the word manipulate in the negative sense of the word, where you think that you can basically trick people into being vegan. 
Um, don't think that like having some type of special approach that achieves that is going to work, right? Um, it's just it's just that most people who do animal rights outreach, and we've been guilty of this for a long time in the first three years that we operated at least, um, we're caught up on all of these things. We were trying, and here's a big one, focusing on being liked as a priority above the truth of what you're saying, as, as a priority above that, right? That's, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Um, when you are so focused on everything you're saying being liked by the other person, you are going to compromise on what you're actually saying. Um, and, and you're not really like, you're not really approaching the interaction with uh, integrity and you're not, you're not really aiming for effectiveness. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I, I get your point, yeah. Um, another little question, um, the point five in the flow chart uh, is the best benefit of being vegan. And uh, as I understood, the point is to, to use the point of view of the animals, the, the big, the better, the best benefit is that no more animals are going to be abused. But the question is, is it wrong to, to put it from the perspective of the, of the person you are talking to? And to say the best benefit for you going vegan is that you are not responsible for any uh, animal abuse. So you don't have any, any, any reason to feel bad because you are not responsible anymore. Is it wrong? Um, well, what's the argument that you, what's your argument? The, 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 problem, the problem is some, some people, they would say, yeah, okay, if, if I go vegan, I am one person, so, and the best benefit uh, is only the, the life of the animals. Okay, one person, it doesn't make any difference. Any difference. So uh, as an answer to that, you can say, no, from your point of view, it's a very big positive, let's say a very big uh, benefit for you because you are not responsible anymore. That's a good point, isn't it? Just to switch in this perspective. Um. I'm confused about your question because we do actually say that. We do say that from your point of view, you are no longer the reason this happens and this no longer happens because of you. Um, and so, and I also addressed this earlier in this workshop, of course, one person becoming vegan, vegan will not end these industries, but the point is that you are no longer the reason this, that this is happening. You know, you are no longer the reason that animals are tormented unimaginably. Um, okay, okay, then, then maybe I understood it uh, wrong or whatever, because I understood that the, the, we should, uh, let's say, and that, um, say that best benefit is that it, um, it's for the animals, but not for the people who is going vegan. Well, for the person, yeah, well, for the person, um, obviously, they will no longer be responsible for this. They'll also no longer be a hypocrite because they said in that interaction, that they are against animal abuse. When it comes to that, they will no longer be hypocritical. They'll no longer be a hypocrite. So a benefit is you actually get to live according to who you say you act, not just who you say you are with your words, but you actually get to live in accordance to who you say you are, right? So, um, so most people, when you say the benefit, when you ask them, what do you think the benefit is? They might think, well, what am I going to get out of this? Is, am I going to get better health? Am I going to get, you know, what do I get out of this? And that's the reason why we point it out that way is because it is important that we point out that their character is being mirrored to them and they will no longer have to be just like other non-vegans in society, walking hypocrites who say that they are against animal abuse against animal oppression whilst being responsible for the worst type of animal abuse on earth. Can you think of anything worse that we could possibly do to animals than what we're, what humans are doing to animals in the meat, dairy and egg industries and the fur industry? Can you think of anything worse? Possibly. Of course not. Humans are doing the worst possible things to animals <clears throat> in those industries. And non-vegans are responsible for that while saying they're against that so, yeah, I hope that answers your question, but we yeah, do absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Thank right. you. Thank you very much, Paul, for your time. Thank you.
You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Adam? Okay, just turn the mic on. Um, I'm not sure if Sandra is still with us, but just to address her point about being shot in the head, the way that I would respond to that would be to say, how would you feel if someone did that to your parents? How would you feel if someone did that to your children? How would you feel if someone did that to your brother and sister? Because the animals, these are social animals. They have, they are parents, they are children, they have brothers and sisters. Um, so right. that's the way that I would address that. Right, and, and so that may work. Um, however, what if they have a bad relationship with their parents? What if they don't have kids? What if, oh, so, so could you please just mute yourself? Oh, I've just muted you, so, so. If you want to ask a question during this Q&A, just raise your hand, which you can do on the Zoom platform, or you can turn your camera on and physically raise your hand. And then at that point, please unmute yourself. Um, so Adam, the point I'm trying to make here is that what has the greatest chance of getting through to people is putting them in the victim's position. You know, what if this was happening to you? Because in most cases, people mostly care about themselves. That's what we've found. And we're in the business of doing what is most effective most of the time. So that's my yep. response to that, Adam. Do you disagree or do you want to expand further on this? No, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't disagree. I would just say that if they don't, if you can't get them on board with that, then it's time to walk away, which brings me to just something in my experience that you, I think you articulated really well how to end the conversation early and why it needs to be ended. Um, the only thing I would add to that would be just basically turn around, walk away. Don't try to say anything witty. Don't try to say anything that's going to draw them in. Just turn around, walk away. That's the most powerful way to end the conversation at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Um, People have, yeah, yeah very, very good point, Adam. People have asked me exactly what to say. Pardon me. <clears throat> Frog in my throat not literally, wouldn't be vegan. Um, but people ask me like, how do you wrap up the conversation? Like, what would you say? Um, and you just summed it up really well, just walk away. But if you have to say something, I would say this is going around in circles, let's wrap this up. I'd like to move on, talk to somebody who's, you know, who's open. Yeah, again, it's not about saying something witty because you don't want to keep, you know, you don't want to keep expanding on the interaction. You want it to end. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point, and thank you for sharing that, Adam. Uh, and then just also, yeah. um, the other thing that I know a lot of people do an outreach struggle with is um, the halal, the vegetarians, and then the the hunter slaughterhouse workers. Um, I've got some tricks that I use to make all those conversations go easy, but I'll probably want to follow up with you on that separately. So hit me up. I'd yeah. love to hear it. Yeah, I'd love to yeah. see it. Thanks, Adam. Georgie. Yeah, hello, everybody. So my question is uh, related rather to my friends uh, rather uh, than to bystanders. Uh, uh, I mean, people who have uh, some sort of trust in me, uh, but uh, I'm from a developing country. I'm from Georgia, which is a borderline between Europe and Asia. And in our country, we have a huge problem re related to the medicine. Very often when I have a conversation with my friends, they would go to the doctor. The doctor would say them that they need to eat animal products, otherwise, they will have uh, uh, issues related to the health and so forth. And like on the one on the one side, uh, 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 it's me, uh, their friend. But on the other hand, there is a medicine. There are uh, professionals. And when they check uh, information on Google, for example, it's not always very clear because when uh, you would ask something, is it healthy to be vegan? Uh, Google uh, would uh, tell you that Dr. Pulip, for example, think that uh, being vegan is healthy, but like it's not a general automatic question which uh, might be acceptable for them. And uh, I uh, speak about uh, people who really uh, are afraid of being vegan in terms of the 
their health. They want, they even ask me about supplement and so forth. I can feel that they are really uh, interested in the issue, but uh, how to deal with that when the medicine is against you and you are not a professional expert in nutrition and you have no medical uh, education and so forth, how to do, how, how to um, approach to this problem if you have any thoughts about this? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you for your question. So we did point this out in the workshop. Um, you could simply point out that doctors, um, general practitioners, they do very little nutritional education in attaining their license to become a general practitioner. Um, you don't need to be a nutritionist or a doctor to know that fact and to point out that fact. So what the doctor says is not necessarily true when it comes to nutrition. Um, Again, all you need to point out is that the science is there for them to look at and they can find out the science easily by using Google. The question you're asking them is, are they open to that? Are you open to looking at the facts of a plant-based diet being perfectly adequate for humans to consume in order to be healthy or not? If they are open to it, they'll find the information very easily. In this day and age, there is an abundance of information on this for them to look at. The, the science is clearly there. And you are also walking and living proof that you can be vegan and be healthy. If they need an example, you're standing right in front of them. Um, but are they open to looking at the facts by using Google or not? That's the question. That's the response. Does that thank satisfy you. your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. All right. You're welcome. All right. Let's move on. Alberto? Yeah, thanks. Um, sorry, I cannot activate my camera. It, it went off the, during the, the meeting. Um, I have more, uh, more a comment uh, than a question. And sure. it's about the veganism defini uh, definition that, sh that you share with us. Uh, first of all, thank, thank uh, for that. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago about it um, because we realized that uh, talking with other vegans, uh, everyone has its own definition mm -hmm. and sometimes it's really complicated to, to explain it. Mm -hmm. And the, the comment to this definition is that uh, there is a state that, that it, uh, it doesn't include um, human rights. Or, or maybe, maybe if you have the slide, I, I didn't write it down. Uh, maybe I, I didn't get it completely, but it's somehow excluding the, the humans. And I understand that the, the point of uh, stating that is to emphasize that we are only focusing on animal rights within the organization, and uh, not to say that um, humans abuse or violence against humans is not important. But in my experience, the, the way it is uh, written might be misunderstood by some people. So just just wanted to to bring that yeah. comment, uh, especially, right. yes. especially, sorry, especially when we are comparing um, or we are creating situations to compare animal abuse with uh, human abuse, uh, yeah. for example, expanding on, on Bruno's comment. Yeah, well, the reason why we put the individual in the victim's position is because it's not possible for you to truly understand how wrong it is unless you imagine it happening to you. And this is the basis for assessing any injustice. If you're going to correctly assess it, you have to imagine being in the victim's position. You have to imagine what it would be like to be forced down a kill line, to be bludgeoned in the head or to be stabbed in the throat, et cetera. You need to, you need to be able to imagine that happening to you. It's not, it's not possible. I'll even go further by saying it's not possible for you to understand the severity of the injustice unless you do that. So that's the reason why we need to do that. Um, but that doesn't mean that this becomes about human rights. 
that just means that in order to understand animal rights, we need to imagine what animals are going through. Of course, this is not about human rights. And of course, human rights are important. There are many hum human rights violations that are occurring around the world. The list is endless, in fact, of all the human rights injustices that are occurring around the world. Uh, this is especially distasteful to conflate it with human rights because humans in this scenario are the actual oppressors. Putting their rights in the same... Con Making this about human rights is quite literally a spit in the animals' faces because humans are the oppressors we're talking about here. Humans are the reason why animals are being uh, having their rights violated. So veganism is about non-human animals who are violated by humans. It is a movement that represents those victims, the victims of human oppression. Okay, we're not we're not. When, when I talk about veganism, when we are addressing veganism as an organization, we're not addressing this necessarily for the deer who's being attacked by a lion, because there's very little that we can do about that in nature. We are addressing this and representing from the, from the perspective, from the position of the victims who are being oppressed by humans. Right. That is this, that is the basis of this movement. We're trying to address the meat, dairy and egg industries mainly, and then all of the other industries that exploit animals after that. The fur industry, the down industry, the leather industry, etc. You get my point. But these are the industries that humans are responsible for. So it's just simply important for there to be a movement that's dedicated to ending that plight, to ending that injustice specifically. So I hope that that clarifies things, Alberto. I don't think we need to get any further into this. Um, I think it's, I think what I'm saying is very easy to understand. And I think you can all agree that of course, this group of beings that are being oppressed by humans by the trillion every year, deserve to have a movement dedicated to them and that's all that we believe veganism represents. So let's yep. move on. Th thanks. Uh, for, for me, it was already clear. But uh, again, I just wanted to say that in my experience, some people may misunderstood the, the, um, this kind of explanation. But okay. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your concern. All right, let's move on. GS. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So um, my question was, um, I, I was thinking about this, this question for uh, like a month right now. I don't know if you talked about it before, um, because I entered in the chat room a little bit late. So um, yeah, I wanted to ask the, the main um, reason why people want change like why why is it so difficult why is it so hard why because veganism is like obvious it's like um there's nothing that speaks against veganism there's nothing justifiable to um that uh, that allow allow human beings to treat animals this way and there's like really no one or like let's say the majority of people could never harm an animal. So mm. then why, if we if we talk to people and and um, and say that everything they thought before they, they beliefs are, are wrong, so why is it so hard for them to, to change? What, what do you think is are the main reasons um, people want? Um. Yeah, well, this is the entire conundrum that we are dealing with as a species, isn't it? Why are humans engaging in such an atrocity when it's so easy to avoid being responsible for that atrocity? And it seems to go completely against what people say that they stand for. They say that they are against animal abuse. And yet, yum, yum, yum are meeting meat, dairy and eggs, right? Like why, this is, a, this is the conundrum. From my understanding, I think it's because social norms take the driver's seat over and above individual values. So people, 
claim to be independent in the way that they think, in the way that they act, and they, they claim to be individuals who think for themselves critically. Um, but what most people do is they forfeit all of that and what takes over that is social norms. So because most people are sharing the guilt, people don't feel like they're animal abusers, you know? So I think it's social norms. I think social norms corrupt individual values and, and the ways that individuals, the way that individuals act. Um, and so then the question is how, like what is the most effective way of cutting through that social norm that they subscribe to and waking them up so that they can act in alignment with who they say they are as an individual. And my answer to that question is following this approach that I've shared and I have covered in this workshop. It is what has the greatest chance of cutting through that social norm. That's absolutely true. I, I thought the same thing. I just wanted to add a little thing um, that confirms what you're saying. And because it's the same thing that I thought too, the, the main reason. Um, it's, it's the same uh, like in Germany. I, I, I live um, in Germany sometimes and, and in Italy. And in Germany, I know that um, nowadays, um, young, young um, people, like like people who are going to school or to university but before even in school it's it's not common to smoke you know like 30 years uh like in, in the 80s or in the 90s maybe it was cool to smoke everybody was smoking everybody you know um did something like that and and nowadays um it's 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 common. It's it's not viewed as cool. It's 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 uncool to to smoke, and so nobody does it anymore because like the majority of people say that it's it's not a good thing. So even if you maybe want to to smoke or, or to do something like that or to drink maybe, uh, if if the majority of people thinks think that it's it's not. Um, it's not a good thing. It's not cool, and and nobody uh, does it. So you you won't do it uh, because they they don't they don't do it. So it's like yeah. it's like the same. If if let's say if if there's a country that's entirely vegan, and someone of another country where they like eat a lot of meat goes to this country on vacation, let's say, do you really think? they would like eat meat there if everybody looks at them and say, okay, that's weird that you eat meat. It's our country. We are all vegan here. So it's, it's really a social thing. So you, you say, okay, I'm, I'm here. I have to fit in. And, um, and so they won't eat meat, even if, if for they, it's, um, it's a normal thing, but they, to, to fit in and to be normal, like all the others, they, they would change in that moment. So it's it's really um, it's a really a social thing because human beings are extremely social. So they they will like behave like like the others, the majority. Yeah, yeah you're. In, yeah, thank you, thank you for sharing that. That that was um, that was um, wise, and I, I think it's it's just you know like as an example by as an example of how much humans are influenced by our environment we ask ourselves like, how could you be a cannibal? How could you like actually eat other humans? For someone who's born into a tribe where that's the culture, it would be abnormal for you to not do that. It would be, you would be a standout in that society to not engage in cannibalism, to not kill and eat other humans. So that's why they do it because they're born into a social norm. And if you pull them aside and had them thinking critically for themselves, they may actually disagree with cannibalism, right? And in that situation, it should be surely easy for you to imagine the injustice happening if, you, if it was happening to you because you're a fellow human yourself. Um, but my point is, is that that person 
is still going to continue do it, doing it most likely if they're just going by the social norm and they're not actually thinking about it for themselves. They're not willing to stand up for their, their values and to stand out from the society that they are in. So we're trying to reach those in society that are willing to say, I don't care about social norms as much as I care about what's right, about what is morally correct. And those people are out there. Many of those people exist out there. So that's who we're trying to reach. Um, so, yeah. And it is unfortunate and it is really troubling to find so many people that are willing to just do what everyone else is doing. And uh, <laughs> meanwhile, saying out of their mouths that they are independent, free thinking, critical, you know, critically thinking people when they're really just followers of how everybody else thinks and acts. Sumaya, let's hear from you. Hi, everyone. Um, this last uh, issue you've talked about, about the social norm is, is really one of the, the main things I've come across in my latest outreach conversations. Even if people are, you can see they are um, understanding and they are um, getting in touch with the values. I get the sense that what holds them back is precisely the social norm and like rituals and the families and friends. So even if I'm talking to them and I can see, oh yeah, this is a positive, I mean, it's reaching out to them, then um, I find myself using phrases like the next thing that they should be able to speak up for animals. Just naturally it comes out because I can feel what holds them back is that, the social thing. That's what, it's perfect that you address this because um, I think it's at the core of why society as how it is at this moment in history. It's just yeah. the, the social thing like, oh, I won't be able to be, uh, I'll have to speak up while I'm with my friends or I won't be able to do this and do that. So that's like really the difficulty in finding people who is actually willing to, to stand up in every aspect, because mm. I mean, we surround it and we know this. And so thank you for addressing that. And I just wanted to thank you, Paul. This has been an amazing workshop. I mean, we already knew everything, but just when I thought it couldn't get any better, it has got better. And I wanted um, to ask if this is, I know you will uh, um, like put the, the link, but is there any way you can make it downloadable? Yes, yes, it will be. Yeah, it thank be. you. Yeah, because I wanna really, I want to have it like for good. I know mm -hmm. you'll keep updating. I mean, that's yes. for sure. But um, I don't want to feel like, oh, the link might go away someday or, or it no, won't no, work okay. or, you know. And I have to give credit where credit is due. Um, our organizers over in Texas, um, Faraz and Darius, are responsible for putting that flowchart together whilst we were brainstorming together. Um, so they have helped out in putting that together. And it's uh, an ode uh, to their efforts, but also uh, because I do wanna make things as simple as possible for you to understand that I put this out there for you to download. But I love that you pointed out the fact that we're going to update and improve as much as we need to in future. So just be mindful of that, that this is ever evolving. Um, we may, because our goal is to just simplify as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, thank I no, thank you. I mean, I think you've mastered this even more. I didn't think it was possible because I've watched the 2.0 and I know there's another one, but I mean, it's the same thing. You've um, created the, um, how do you call it? The sheet, the... Um, the, the, the yeah. yeah, exactly that one, um, which is a uh, uh, new, but like the video itself, the way it's expressed, I mean, it couldn't be more inspiring. And we, 
it's like going over and over the same thing we already have in our hearts, at least me, and just love hearing it. So yeah, what I meant one downloadable is the video if possible. Oh yes, the video will be available. I'll be uploading it to YouTube. So, and I look forward to doing that and making this available for those who couldn't join or for any of you who would like to watch this back as a refresher. And I'll be doing more of these uh, over the next couple of months. So next weekend, I'm doing two of these and thereafter I'll be doing more of these. Um, the idea is that I'm doing these for a campaign that we're doing this year, a new campaign called Regions Organizing for Animal Rights. This specifically today is for Germany, like I mentioned earlier, Croatia, uh, Slovenia, and I, I know that there's another country or two that I'm missing out, but it's the Germany and Balkans region. And um, next week uh, I'm doing the same thing for France and also for New Zealand on the same day. Um, so you'll see me doing more of these. If you'd like to join those, you can, you can also join those. You just have to, um, look at the times that it's happening. The France one next week is happening at the same time that this one is happening on, on Saturday. Um, and it's, it's just really good to refresh, to refresh on this because Sumaya, what you've said there is, is, is profound. You already know this to be true. All I'm telling you is what you already know to be true. The reason why I'm focusing on these principles is because real recognize real you know what i'm saying is true it that's why i say this is nuts and bolts i'm not i'm not even focusing on like how how things are said necessarily as much as what needs to be said what is the angle what is the point what what are we trying to get to here and it's about cutting through uh with truth and getting to the core of the problem the the, the root of the problem and um and, and yeah, so thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. That is the goal of this workshop is to improve slightly on the last iteration and to make this even simpler for all of you to understand. And the, and the goal is for you to be confident about this approach that anyone who's watching this can do this. You don't need to be a specialist in, in communication. You don't need to be um, well-versed in all of the statistics and, and whatnot. You can do this approach and it is extremely effective. Yeah, so. what I meant, yeah, thank you, Paul. What I meant is that what we already know as activists is like this, the, the um, outreach protocol, I mean, 100% full in, no doubt about anything. And it's been like that for a while because it's, it's not the, like the latest development. It's just the way you've presented it. Now what I feel is the fire to actually share this like more um, vigorously with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I obviously have the possibility to do it in person, but this mm -hmm. is what I feel like now, like transmitting this as it is uh, not that I haven't done it before, obviously I have, but since we ha have this like scheme and everything, that's what I meant by what we already know, because the, the protocol, it was already there. And I th think yeah. we all agree, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Right, I see. Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you so much, Samaya. I appreciate it. All right, in the interest of time, we've got nine minutes before we end this according to the time frame that this was scheduled for. It was scheduled for three hours, so we're doing really good for time here. Nine more minutes, ideally. I'm happy to go longer if you guys want me to go longer, but I am mindful of the fact that you guys have a cube to go to after this if you're in Germany or the Balkans region. So, uh, Michael, I'll take your question, and I'd love to hear what other questions any of you might have after that. Go ahead, Mark. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to agree with Samaya and wanted to give you a big kudos, Paul, for, for this brilliant workshop. Um, just wanted to mention one thing. Already the previous workshop really helped me and I think others to hone in on, on this uh, approach. And we've noticed a significant uh, improvement in, in the reactions also of the people when they walked, as they were walk away from the conversation. And I remember um, a couple months ago, we were doing this at the train station in Alamodes, and there was a student 
and literally I was I was blown away. I just because and this this shows me that when you when you say the right things, it can um, really move mountains within people. I was blown away that within one minute, I think it was just one or one and a half minute, he was he was ready to say, okay, I'm I'm going vegan, and he really meant it. So this is how effective it's been already, and now this this upgrade is even. I think it's going to be even more effective. So thanks again. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that, Michael. And I'm really, really glad to hear that. Um, since I've been doing the Holding Non-Vegans Accountable workshops, and the first one was at the beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic hit, um, I haven't been getting the type of positive feedback that is anywhere even remotely comparable to the feedback that I've been getting from this approach. And I've been doing workshops since 2016 around the world. I've been doing workshops to large numbers of people around the world and doing them online. And the feedback that I've been getting since the Holding on Vegans Accountable workshop is just in a completely different galaxy in terms of how positive it is. And um, the type of testimonials I'm getting is, is really affirming to me that this is working around the world by all walks of life in many different types of um, locations ge geographically. This works everywhere. So I'm really, I'm just really glad that this is working out as effectively as it is. And I appreciate you sharing that feedback, guys. So GS, let's hear from you again. You've got your hand raised. You're muted. I'm sorry. <laughs> First of all, it is definitely very, very effective uh, and uh, really helpful. And you did a great job with this workshop, like uh, with the others. So thank you from my part uh, too. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask you really quickly is if we have, or if I have, let's say, and an, some other questions um, like during this, these months, is it is it possible to write to you like on Facebook or something if, if there's something we need to to know? Can I reach out to you? I would, that is such a great point um, to maybe end this workshop on. If you do have any questions, feedback, testimonials, I'll, criticism about this approach, please message me either on Facebook or you can email me if you don't. Um, if for whatever reason, if you don't get through to me on Facebook, my email is paul at anonymousforthevoiceless.org. Sorry, sorry, can you repeat, Paul? Sure, it's paul at anonymousforthevoiceless.org. Anonymous Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm glad that you made that point because I do want you all to know that you can reach me. Thank you, guys.